Good morning and uh, welcome to the 46th Learn with Lorna. We'll get started in a second. I'm always sitting waiting to see who's the first person to get in and say hello. So uh, welcome to the 46th Learn with Lorna. Uh, my name is Lorna Steele and I'm the Community Engagement Officer with the Highland Archive Service. For those of you who haven't been part of these before, um, the Highland Archive Service uh, is a local authority archive within the Highland, uh, the Highland Council area. We are also a collecting archive, so we have all sorts of different things within our collections. We have um, four archive centres across the Highlands. We have the Highland Archive and Registration Centre in Inverness, which is the hub office, an archive centre in Wick, which is Nucleus, the Nuclear and Caithness archives, uh, an archive centre in Portree, which is Sky and Loch Alsh archives, and one in Fort William, which holds the Loch Aber records. So it's nice uh, to see everybody saying hello, Boner Bridge minus 14. Yeah, I'm just outside Inverness and it was um, uh, minus 12 last night, I think, but not quite as bad as parts of Sutherland, which went up to uh, I think minus it went down to I think minus twenty two something like that. So I was I was excited about seeing everyone's comments about the weather coming in. I'm sure for some of you in uh, Australia this will be uh, mind boggling. <laughs> so before we go any further, um, a reminder that this series is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. That High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland, and that there's no payment or subscription required to take part in this Learn with Lorna series of talks. But if you're able to donate towards our work, uh, then we would very much appreciate that. There's a link to be able to do so within uh, the, the text of this article, uh, of this film. So uh, we would very much appreciate that. Um, thank you for liking my jumper, Andrea. I bought it yesterday and I love it. So I'm glad you've noticed. So we've learned education lessons before. Um, right back at the beginning, nearly a year ago, uh, we looked at education as a wider subject, talking about the um, admission registers, school uh, school board minutes, things like that. Um, but today we're looking very specifically just at school logbooks and some of the stories that can be found uh, within them. We have hundreds of school logbooks in our collections because, as I mentioned, we are a local authority archive. So we hold school records on behalf of Highland Council. We are the official repository for school logbooks, admission registers uh, and so on. And so we hold probably about 700, over 700 school logbooks um, from Durness in the north and, and uh, in the north of Sutherland, but also obviously Caithness, uh, right down to Dalwini and on the, the boundaries where, that we share with um, uh, Perth and Kinross. So a huge, a huge range of a geographical area covered within these school logbooks. Most of them date from 1872 onwards, which was the Education Scotland Act, and that led to much more standardised record keeping. And throughout this series, you you've, will have heard me talk before about the certain pieces of legislation that led to much more standardised record keeping. And, and the 1872 Education Scotland Act was one of those. And so the majority date from 1872 onwards, but some do predate this, and we have some great examples. One of my favourites from um, um, Bewley, I think it's Bewley, um, Bewley Free Church, that, that with a very opinionated teacher talking about why he's not paid enough and how he should be getting paid more. Um, quite, quite fun. And one of the wonderful things about school logbooks, from my point of view, is that they they show things that schools have in common, but they also have show things uh, that things are, are that are different across the schools. So, what I mean is, the information they contain to some extent can be quite standardised in that they talk about attendance, they talk about local weather, they talk about uh, what's affecting the building or the running of the school. But the content of those things is very much varies depending on where the school is. Um, so. You will see that as we come through how what would be completely normal in one area would be completely strange in another area. Um, and as I say, some have very voluble teachers, some have um, teachers with opinions, but uh, many of them are um, much more factual based rather than opinions. 
Another great thing is that they show schools, some show schools that still exist. So, for instance, we'll have ones that date, you know, uh, 100, 150 years worth of a run of a school that still exists. That's great. Um, and the other, some show schools that closed 50, 60 years ago. And so that gives us a little insight into something that doesn't exist anymore. So what are the school logbooks? Why are they kept? Uh, why were they kept originally? So these are diaries written by a teacher, usually the head teacher. They are usually written once a week. And one of the main purposes of them was to record attendance and to record events that affected the life of the school and the community around the school. Attendance is talked about a lot because attendance figures were what enabled the school to be given um, the, the, enabled the amount of grant that the school was given. So the teachers talk an awful lot about uh, the attendance figures. They sometimes refer to individual pupils, but not not very frequently. It depends. We often say you had to either be very good or very bad to get a mention, uh, something notable one way or the other. Um, so for that reason, they're closed for 50 years. So you'll maybe remember me talking about admission registers saying these are off, these are closed for 100 years because of the personal detail. School logbooks contain much less personal detail, but uh, we still have that closure on just uh, to protect them. So what I thought I would do is pick out some of the things that can be found in school logbooks and just give some examples to illustrate them. So I'm going to read out some examples that talk about schools opening and closing. Uh, some that talk about the weather, it's marvellously suitable for today. How the First World War and Second World War uh, affected life in schools. References to agriculture and industry in the area, subjects and um, school reports, all sorts of things. Uh, I was going to, I, I'm not going to read out to you, but I will start by telling you that I found an extract from Leeds where they said that they'd had to get the windows repaired because um, a pigeon had flown through one window and through the next window and smashed both panes of glass. So you have to wonder how fast that pigeon was going to smash all the windows. Um, but yes, I thought I would not read you that extract. Okay, so as I said, the, the logbooks sometimes give great information about schools opening or closing, which is great to see from our point of view how that changed the area. A school opened uh, and becomes a focus of the community. And so I wanted to read to you two extracts, one from Dulcie School in uh, Nairnshire and one from Invergordon. So the Dulcie one is from 1890 and it says, this school was opened on Tuesday the 7th inst at 10 o'clock by Alexandrina Penny, who has been appointed teacher in the temporary school at Burnside. The school has been opened regularly each day, both forenoon and afternoon. The attendance has been small owing to stormy weather and colds being prevalent among the children. On Wednesday the 15th, the school was visited by the Reverend Mr Miller who addressed the pupils. Fair progress has been shown. No separate entry for last week as the logbook only arrived today. So that's a, a very, um, in some ways, just kind of standard entry, but really interesting to think of those practicalities. We couldn't keep a logbook because it hadn't arrived today, but I know I need to be keeping the logbook. And then on the 24th of January, a few days later, the teacher writes, uh, the school was opened at the regular hours, both forenoon and afternoon, except Friday, which was given as a holiday to allow for a floor to be put into the schoolroom. Interesting. <laughs> Makes you wonder, they're in this uh, intense stormy weather and did they have uh, just an earth floor before that? The Invergordon Public School uh, entry that I wanted to read to you dates from 1875. So this will be one of the schools that opened after the Education Act. And it's particularly beautifully written. It's um, quite elaborate and it's quite funny. Sometimes you find, as we all do in life, that it starts very beautifully and then the teachers realise they don't have time so they can become a little bit less, uh, a little bit less neat as time goes on. So this one is from the 2nd of September, 1875 from Invergordon. And it says, this school was opened on Thursday morning in the town hall with praise and prayers by James King, headmaster. There were present several of the school board of the parish of Roskeen and a number of the parents of pupils. After opening, Mr MacLeod of Cadbull in Vergordon Castle, in a very kindly speech, addressed the pupils and the teacher, expressing the hope that this school, uh, now organised for the first time under the Education Act of Scotland 1872, 
that success might attend them and the pupils in all of their labours, which is nice, uh, a nice entry. And then she goes, uh, the teacher goes on to say that um, they're, they're categorising all the pupils, putting them into groups that they think uh, is suitable for their levels, but then goes on to say it's been very difficult to do this because uh, a great majority of the pupils are very unequal in their attainment and so it's very difficult to grade, put them into uh, grades because some of them haven't attended school before, some of them have attended part of school or things like that and so it's very difficult for the teacher to work out where they should all sit within the levels and these are just the the day-to-day -day challenges um, that come with with setting up a school and, and working out getting to know your pupils and where they fit within the system. Sometimes uh, pupils, uh, the school logbooks talk about pupil teachers, as I saw it had just been mentioned in one of the comments, and also references to side schools. Now, side schools were a smaller school that was kind of addendum onto the, uh, a main school for reasons, usually because it was too far for some pupils to travel to get to the school. And so a side school would be set up and that would maybe be run by a pupil teacher who would be an, an ex-pupil who was an older uh, maybe the age of leaving school and had supported the teacher and so sometimes they would lead the side schools. But I wanted to read you an extract from Isle Martin Site School. This is from January the 31st 1922 and it just goes to show as I said the sort of things that vary massively across an area. I know some of you are watching in, in uh, Glasgow and, and other places. I think I don't know because I haven't looked right through Glasgow records, but I think it would be very unlikely you would find an entry like this within a city school logbook. So this is from Isle Martin Side School, 1922. January the 31st. Visited this side school today. On the roll there are four boys, of whom one was absent owing to illness. A room of Mr MacLeod's house is used as the classroom. The ages of the children range from five to ten years. The oldest boy appears to be very intelligent and it is hoped that arrangements may be made to have him transferred to the Ullapool school without delay. So just interesting to see that the, the school is being carried on within the teacher's house and that there are four pupils age range from, age range from five to ten. And I know from working with, with schools across the Highlands that that's not as unusual as, as it might seem. You know, we still have many schools in the Highlands where there are... Uh, 10, 15, 20 pupils and, and that wide age range. Um, but I think usually they're not taught in the teacher's sitting room anymore. One of my favourite side school entries come from uh, Croik Farm Side School, which is three and a half miles from the main uh, Croik School. And as I flicked through the entries, it says we have 100% attendance today, 100% attendance, 100% attendance. And then when I got to the next page, it said, there are two pupils on the roll. So, I mean, you, you're all you're always going to hit 50% or 100%, aren't you? So um, that's a particularly lovely example. And that school closed in 1953. And I wanted to read you the extract that talks about the closing, because as I say, those are key moments as well in a community's life. And you can see where a school closed and how that has an impact uh, on the surrounding area, or why that is as transport improves or as weather conditions deteriorate, things like that. So this is an, uh, an extract from Croik Farm Site School from December the 10th. There has been perfect attendance since November the 28th. This school closes today as the pupils are in future to attend Croik Public School, where the teacher of this side school is to take over the teaching of the pupils now attending Croik Primary, in addition to the pupils of this side school in the near future. The side school was closed at 3.30pm by the singing of the Christmas paraphrase number 19, a prayer was offered by Reverend W.M. Craig and the children joined in repeating the Lord's Prayer. So that's December the 10th, 1943, but it's interesting that on November the 6th, 1944, there's a sentence that says, this school has, this side school has reopened. The three pupils on the roll are Virginia M. Moffat, James Moffat and Sheila Moffat. What I'm obviously really hoping is that someone is going to comment and go, oh my word, I'm Virginia Moffat. That would be marvellous. Um, but yeah, like I say, just, just extracts that talk about um, these side schools coming and going, the main schools opening and closing, and as I say, how that has an effect uh, on 
uh, on the, the community and, and the families in, in the community. So as I mentioned, side schools often were established because uh, winter, because of the distance, sorry, it was quite often established because it would be that maybe pupils couldn't get to the main school. And off, that was particularly the case in winter weather, that, meant that they couldn't get down a glen or um, across a, a river or something like that, and so they would be a smaller school attended. But I've mentioned before how frequently school logbooks talk about the weather. Um, there is a, an absolute obsession with weather in school logbooks. And I've spoken in the past about some extracts of floods, of storms, um, for instance, in one of the Loch Aber logbooks about the, the bridge being washed away and so the pupils couldn't attend school, things like that. And I remember mentioning uh, one of my favourite extracts, which is from Loch Inver Primary, uh, talking about the wind was so strong that the pupils couldn't get round the corner to get into the school because they kept the wind kept hitting them and they couldn't get into the school, which I don't know why I'm laughing. That's very mean of me, but I just find it um, a, a funny wee uh, extract. But I wanted to read to you uh, an extract from Glenfeshi uh, School in 1938 about the effort that some families would go to to ensure that their children got to school no matter what the weather was. So this is from um, March the 7th, 1938, Glenfeshi, just uh, near Aviemore. So the teacher writes, the past two weeks have given 100% attendance uh, and I've taken the previous two weeks. The previous two weeks of attendance was broken owing to snowfall and blocked roads. And then on March the 21st, the teacher says, after three weeks of perfect attendance in succession, the heavy snowfall has caused, caused the percentage this week to drop to 48.5. Snowdrifts have blocked the roads for the scholars in the Glen, but the Cameron children have been carried to school every morning by their father and he returns for them at 3.30 to carry them home again. I just, I love that extract, the determination of a parent to, to get their child to school. And it just makes a very clear image of them um, the father holding, the, carrying the children. I'm seeing, Leslie, your comments there about um, soup kitchens and things. There are some interested, um, some really interesting extracts about that. There's one, I think, in Leed, very similar about uh, a school, a, a soup kitchen that was set up by um, a lady in the community and the school supporting that. So that's a little bit uh, about the weather. The seasons can be seen in all sorts of other ways in the school logbooks. There's, again, I've, I've probably spoken about this very frequently because they appear so regularly within the logbooks, references to the agricultural year and the farming year. So frequent references to pupils being off to plant uh, turnips, to lift potatoes, to cut peat, to uh, gather cranberries, all sorts of different things. Very many um, references to that within the school logbooks. And this example is from Oldshore in Sutherland, December 1915. And uh, it reads that the children have been supplied, today the children have been supplied with soup, some venison having arrived from the Ray Forest to supply the school for a few weeks. The attendance this week is somewhat affected by a catch of herring in Loch Clash. The children are being kept at home as the mothers are away herring gutting. So again, you can see just the the agricultural year going on um, around around the school and how that impacts school attendance and what the children are doing. And what I thought was um, particularly interesting there, and this is something that my colleague Catherine and I uh, in Sky have spoken about frequently, that extract there is from 1915. So obviously we're a year into the First World War, over a year into the First World War, and there are pupils there sitting at school eating venison. <laughs> um, and it's just funny how where you are, where you live and where you grow up influences what you think is uh, what you think is normal. You know, there would have been a lot of people who would have been desperate for venison, but it, it was uh, a staple food for people who lived uh, up a glen. So a different norm can be seen there. I'm going to pause halfway through and um, remind you that this series is brought to you by High Life Island at no cost to the viewer, that High Life Island is a charity registered in Scotland and that there's no payment or subscription required to take part in these talks. But if you're able to donate towards our work, 
we would be very, very um, appreciative of that. I'm also just going to mention I'm seeing a lot of people commenting about specific logbooks and do we have them? And I see my colleague Jennifer has, has replied. But just to reiterate that our catalogues are online now. So um, if there's any particular school or any other subject you're interested in, you're wondering if we hold anything, then please do have a look at our online catalogue and you can search the keywords you're interested in and see what records we hold. Um, so please do do that and I'll, I'll come back and mention that again at the end. So that last extract was from 1915 and I uh, mentioned the impact of the First World War. And of course, the wars feature, feature a lot in school logbooks. And as I've mentioned previously, not all of them. Some teachers seem utterly oblivious to the war going on because it's not affecting their daily life, maybe. But for other schools, uh, there are a lot of references to, uh, for instance, pupils gathering sphagnum moss to make uh, band to support making bandages, um, gathering books in to send to the troops, raising money, all sorts of things. But I wanted to read a particular couple of extracts from World War One. I. I find this um, really quite moving. And I'll be interested to, to, to see what you feel about it. This is from March 1916, and this is from Central Primary School in Inverness. March the 17th, 1916. Mr Bruce left on the 16th inst, having been called up under the Derby Group system to serve in the army. Miss Grace MacDonald takes his place in, the class, in class two, and the classes of the junior department have been rearranged so that Miss MacDonald uh, can take over that work. So this is uh, the teacher being called up. The entry from um, from later that year the, the talks about the school prize uh, prize giving ceremony and what they would normally be doing and they would normal, normally have an event and they would normally have uh, prizes. But it notes that there are no prizes to be given away this year because the pupils themselves had chosen to forego having any prizes because they would rather that the money was used to support the troops at the front and provide comforts for the troops. And I wonder to what extent having teachers knowing a person who had left the school to go and serve influenced that. And we see this through, through both World Wars in Central that they're very, very involved in um, supporting the war effort and trying to trying to raise money and trying to um, support what's happening at the front. So a later entry from the 5th of June 1917 records that Mr Bruce, who had left to join the Gordon Highlanders on the 16th of March 1916, has now been reported missing in action. And then on the 1st of February 1918, the extract reads, Official notice has now been received from the War Office that Mr A. Mitchell Bruce, on the staff of this school, died on or after the 23rd of April last. And then on the 10th of April 1918, so almost uh, a year after he died, the extract reads, Before closing the school for Easter vacation today, the managers and I unveiled the Bruce Memorial tablet in the school hall. And I am uh, reliably informed that that, that tablet is, is still there and, and still um, still known about and still remembered and that, that life of that teacher is still remembered. But I wonder, as I say, how much that had an influence on the pupils who are very kind of avidly supporting raising money for the troops and knitting and sending things to to um, other children in, in other areas of the war. So I just I wonder how much that, that had an impact on that. Now, of course, that would be an absolutely nightmarish situation for the teachers and the pupils to lose a member of their staff, but something uh, equally or or more perhaps worse um, in laid school, which the uh, an extract in the First World War reads: Three former pupils have made the supreme sacrifice. Captain Kenneth McKeever killed on March the twenty seventh, Private Alexander Mackenzie on the twenty ninth, and Private Robert Mackenzie on March the twenty seventh. So. Uh, difficult to lose a teacher and difficult to lose uh, previous pupils. The Ardisier School logbooks, which uh, just sits along the coast from Fort George, they talk about pupils holding concerts to raise money 
for the war memorial fund. So at the end of the war, the pupils are, are actively involved in raising money for the war memorial fund so that there could be a memorial to the local men who had fallen. Um, and it's interesting in the Second World War that the, the Ardisir logbook immediately, as soon as war is, the Second World War is declared, it says the, the, the town children came to school and the fort children didn't. So the fort children went back, presumably as they're trying, you know, working out what happens in the military base and, and where those troops are, what those troops are going to be doing. So it just goes to show that, you know, the, the war itself impacted the pupils and the school, but then following that, um, the pupils are also involved in that commemoration and the raising money and supporting the community going forwards. And then, of course, hard on the heels of the First World War came the Spanish flu, which has been so much uh, in the news of, of late because of the comparisons to our current situation. And it's interesting to look at these ep epidemics in school logbooks and see how they're referred to. So, for instance, several schools mention uh, in 1883 measles epidemics closing the school. Uh, 1950s, there's a uh, quite a severe flu outbreak. There's scarlet fever, etc. But one um, really interesting extract, which I put up on Twitter yesterday, if anybody anybody has seen that, the Rogart School logbook opens with a list of um, all the epidemics that had had an impact on the school life, and that records in just 1917 and 1918, whooping cough, scarlet fever, measles chickenpox, infectious tonsillitis and Spanish flu epidemics. So a constant disruption to children's learning as, as we're seeing uh, at the moment. I wanted to read an extract from Boner Bridge School Logbook from 1918, which is obviously the, uh, as the, the Spanish flu epidemic really started to take off. And there are, there are quite a few references to it um, over the over the course of uh, a few weeks. So the 28th of October 1918 says, uh, the school opened up after the potato lifting week, but as only six scholars appeared in the senior room and five in the junior room on account of the influenza, sent a letter to the board asking for instructions, received notice from the clerk of the school board ordering the school to be closed. And then the 4th of November, did not open the school on the, uh, as the board thought did not open school as the board thought the order for closing should stand for another week as a precaution against the spread of this epidemic in this area. And then on the 11th, opened the school after being closed for three weeks. But, let me just scroll to the next page. On the 26th of November again, owing to the prevalence of the influenza, the attendance is yet very reduced and the school has already been closed for three weeks. So we think it best to try and continue with an open school at present. But then goes on to say, we regret now that the two assistant teachers are absent on account of, of influenza. And then again, you see uh, a later extract, the 2nd of December, that the school board again just says, look, just close the school until we're over this um, worst wave. Which, as I say, I just I find very interesting in the comparison to, to what's happening at the moment. The logbooks for World War II, I'm just seeing a question about evacuees, and yes, the, the logbooks for World War II do reference evacuees coming. Um, they talk about uh, the, the impact that has uh, on the teachers, how difficult it is for the teachers to maintain uh, consistency and control when people pupils are coming and going. Um, there is problems with discipline because, of course, everybody is frightened and away from home and um, Yes, yeah, so yes, there, there are references to evacuees in school logbooks and, and all sorts of other things. But I wanted to, if you can, lighten the mood during the war, um, to lighten the mood a little bit by my new favourite World War II extract, which was sent over to me in a message by my colleague Catherine and Sky uh, the other day. I am, I mean, see what you make of this, I'm unsure. So this is from Killen and Sky, 1942. 15th of May, 1942. The children attended a cinema show, The Navy in Wartime, in Glen Hall on the Friday the 15th. The show was given by Mrs Douglas and at the end of the performance, she presented each child with a savings certificate token at the value of 15 shillings. So far, so good. 29th of May 1942. On Tuesday of this week, Mrs Stevenson, Chief Salvage Officer for the county, visited the school and spoke to the children on the urgent need for paper and bones. 
She had some specimens of articles required in the war effort. The children were very interested and have already begun gathering bones, which are now ac accumulating in the corner of the playground. So if anyone would like to throw in a suggestion of why they would be gathering bones, I would be interested to hear that. Now, obviously, collecting bones is not a, a, a normal part of the school curriculum, but the school logbooks do talk about the school curriculum. They give insight into subjects taught. Um, a couple even include timetables, which show not only the different subjects that pupils are learning, but the split between boys and girls. And I'm sure um, many of you, in, in my time, we didn't have any split between the subjects, but um, obviously it was not that long ago that there was a split between woodwork and sewing or uh, something like that. It's interesting to note on one of the timetables that the boys are given arithmetic um, when the girls are given sewing. Um, but they talk about many subjects that we that we know and that we still uh, study today, geography, history, English, maths, things like that. But there are references to, to subjects that we don't study as frequently now. Um, dictation, Latin, copywriting, oral composition. But my favourite appears uh, on the Linwilg timetable. So for a, the last half hour on a Friday afternoon, they study, they have fairy tale. But my absolute favourite thing, which I really think we should instate, uh, reinstate um, for training of all ages and, and uh, schools, uh, is uh, an hour every morning of general intelligence. So just learn some things, I think that means. There are references to Gaelic throughout these. Um, there we go. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Fiona. Ex excellent suggestions for why bones might be needed. That's, I knew I could rely on you all. Um, yes, there are references to Gaelic throughout the school logbooks. Um, all subjects needed to be taught in English. And so this is often seen as one of the th thing, one of the major factors in the decline of Gaelic speaking, because um, in, in forcing a whole generation to learn in one language takes away, um, you know, the, the natural ability to speak in the other language. Although obviously pupils would still be speaking at home, um, but uh, kind of reducing it through the education system has an effect. And obviously it was a challenge for those pupils who were who had Gaelic as a first language. Um, and there's an extract from uh, the Skerry School Inspector's Report from 1879, so up uh, Tongue in Sutherland. This is from uh, the Inspector's Report from 1879. The new premises entered in May are handsome and commodious. The writing desks, however, should have shelves or slate racks. The work of the school was very well done. The standard subjects had very few mistakes. The grammar, geography and history were very good and the intelligence of the children was very satisfactory, all the more striking as English is a foreign language to them. 16 children from Island Roan made a very good appearance also. So there's an, a, an awareness there that, that English is a foreign language for many of these uh, students. And there are sometimes references to Gaelic which we find uncomfortable, difficult, patronising, eh, all round obnoxious. Um, so, for instance, in 1909, uh, Killen Inspector's report in Sky um, mentions traces of Gallic idiom should should disappear from the written composition of the most advanced pupil. So there is a, a, an active attempt to, to get rid of Gallic idiom. And from 1876 in Carbust Primary in Sky, to stop drawling and a too rapid and imperfect style of reading, the teacher has been obliged to have a portion of the reading lessons read backwards almost daily pronunciation is very indifferent and difficult to drop. For example, chelus instead of jealous and doc instead of dog, um, which was, you know, quite actively tried to be stamped out, which, um, you know, is, is a, a difficult thing, I think, for us to, to hear and to think about now. So inspector's reports are fantastic and, and there are a lot of inspector's reports to be found right throughout all these school logbooks. They would visit throughout the year and write a report of um, what, they, the, the, what they found the standard of discipline to be, the standards of learning and ability, the school buildings, um, are there any problems within the, the running of the school that need to be commented upon or praised. Um, so they're really interesting school inspectors reports. 
there are also um, references to, as I say, to discipline, to, to children getting the belt for having, um, for throwing stones, uh, all sorts of, of different things. And, and there are some examples of school logbooks that record the discipline um, procedures within it. Uh, for instance, there you shouldn't be using a belt in the infant department unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, again, this this all stopped before I was at school, but I'm quite quite sure many of you will will remember it. I'm going to uh, stop talking, but I hope that you'll see why we love school logbooks. School logbooks get a great insight uh, into the life of a school, into the life of a community. Whether it's wartime or peacetime, you can see how the the calendar year and the events surrounding a community reflect are reflected within the school. Whether they're raising money for troops or attending events to mark a local a local market, um, or local wedding or feast day, references to uh, uh, Victoria's jubilee, things like that, and how those things that happen far away uh, have an effect on learning. Uh, in, in a, a small community school. I think they're also really good for giving context about the lives of children in the past. And if you have ancestors who grew up in the Highlands, even if you don't find a reference to them, you'll find something in these books that just tell you a little bit about what life might have been like around them. Now, as I mentioned, please do uh, have a look at our online catalogues. If you're interested in finding out what we hold about school records or about anything else at all, our catalogues are available online. I can put within the comments on this film on Facebook, I can put uh, a link into our catalogues. Please do have a look through there. There's all sorts of, of uh, awesome things in there. So please do have a look. And also, if you're interested in finding out more about the history and development of uh, education in the Highlands, we're running a new set of archive classes online starting in March. These are normally done face to face, but we uh, have adapted them to be able to deliver them online. So if you're interested in finding out about that, please do email us at uh, archives at highlifehighland.com and we'll be able to give you the, the pricing and the, the dates for those if you would like to attend. I hope you can join me next week. I'll be looking at one particular school next week, which is Fort William Public School, um, which has, uh, has had a long and interesting history as a school, but now also is uh, the building in which Lochaber Archive Centre is situated. So a building that we have a particular connection to. Really nice to be situated in a building that we hold the records for, uh, which is uh, lovely. So thank you for joining me. Thank you for all your lovely comments. Um, you could listen to me all day, Irene. That's fine, pop round, we'll have a cup of tea. It'll be lovely. Um, I can talk all day, so no bother. Uh, thank you again, and I'll, I'll see you next week. But a reminder that this series is brought to you uh, by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. That High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and that there's no payment or subscription required to take part in these events. But if you're able to uh, donate towards our work, then we would very much appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs>